All right, here we go. Hi, welcome everyone. Hello. Hi there. Hi, Denise. Hi, Judy. Hi, Shirley. I see some faces I re recognize. Always good to see everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Andrea. Welcome to Therapy Break. So excited to have you on today. So we do a lot of online programs, many of which feature physicians and neuroscientists, and they have a lot to teach us, but they don't have all the answers. So Therapy Break is one of my favorite programs. We do this once a month, and it's a chance to feature and hear from all of the many allied health professionals out there, all of the people like today, we're going to hear from Lindsay, who's a music therapist, um, just about other ways to, you know, to, uh, to round out your, I don't know if you need, even need to call it your therapy regimen, just a way to, to round out your life. So I think I see that everyone now, their audio has been connected and, um, we are exactly one minute into the program. So I will go ahead and introduce our amazing guest today, Lindsay Zarin. Lindsay, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrea. First of all, I am thrilled to be here with all of you today. I'm so excited to share about music therapy and specifically what music therapy can do for people with Parkinson's and their care partners. It's a field I've been working in for several years now and um, have a lot of fun doing these programs. So I'm excited that you're here. I hope you're ready to move, ready to sing a little bit, and ready to take some deep breaths with me this evening as we learn about music therapy and the best ways that it can support you in your life. And my whole entire thing is how can I help you through music to live your life out loud? So that's what we're going to be talking about today, how to live your life out loud. Sound like a plan? Sounds like yeah. a plan. For the <laughs> opening portions, um, we'll have people on mute, but, but we'll follow your cues, Lindsay, when you want us to open it up and we can have questions or hear from people or literally hear voices sing. Um, we want this to be um, as interactive as possible when we're not all physically in the same room. Absolutely. And the virtual world is opening up a lot of new things and we have a lot of fun things we can do together, a lot of ways to make music and a lot of ways to benefit our own health and well-being, even virtually. So I'm happy to see you all here. Great. All right. Should we start with slides? Excellent. Yes. All right. So we're going to be talking again today about how music therapy can help you and your care partners to live life out loud. One of my favorite things to do. <laughs> but to get started, we're going to get moving. So let's go ahead and plant both of your feet flat on the floor. Sit up nice and tall. I like to make sure that my feet are planted flat on the floor and about shoulders width distance apart because then if I have to stand up really fast, I have this really safe, secure base underneath me. And that's really important to make sure that we are nice and safe if we have to stand up quickly. Everyone's posture looks great. I think you'll recognize this song, a little moving and grooving to get us started. All right, we're gonna start out with some passive proprioceptive tapping. This is finding the beat of the song. Yeah, we're gonna start up the arm. You got it. All the way up to your shoulder. Yeah, and of course, if you wanna sing Katrina and the Waves, by all means. And we're gonna go back down. Yeah, if you want to add some extra side-to-side -side movement in there, we're going to go up the inside of our arms next. All the way up to that shoulder. Then we're going to spend a little extra time on the shoulder. Give yourself a little massage. Nice. Other side. Yeah, now's a good time to check your facial expression. Are you smiling? 
Did you know that smiling releases dopamine? My mom always told me if I smiled, I would feel better. I hate that she's right. All right, inside of the arm. You've got it. All the way up to that shoulder again. And then we'll pause there, a little massage. Excellent. To the chest. Yeah. Then we're going to cross the arms. Yeah, Frank, I see you clapping. I love it. Perfect. When we cross our arms like this, it helps the hemispheres of our brain to better communicate with each other. Helps with better movement. Helps us control our body. Uncross, down to the stomach. Ate a little digestion here. <laughs> I like to see those shoulders move. All right, down to the legs. Nice loud tap. Yeah, how low can you go? <laughs> you can't get all the way to your toes, that's okay. I don't give out trophies. All right, come on back up. Come to your jaw, open real wide. And close it. Open wide. And close. One more, open real wide. And close, feel where your jaw hinges, give yourself a little massage. This gets the synovial fluid going in this joint, helps the jaw to open up a little wider. The wider we open our jaw, the more sound gets out, the louder we can live life. Perfect, all right, taps on the face. Find that big smile again. Yeah, all the way to the top of the head. Reach up real tall, take a deep breath in. Exhale, let it go. You look beautiful. Inhale, arms up. And exhale, lower them down and shake it out. Awesome, awesome. How are we feeling? See lots of smiles, lots of heads shaking, nodding, <laughs> perfect. So a couple of things that we were doing right there that are so important. That exercise is called passive proprioceptive tapping. And really it's just a fancy way of saying that we're tapping across our bodies. As we do that, we let our brain know where our body is in space. This is a really important thing. As we do that also, it gets blood flow through the body. When we tap in rhythm to a song, our heart rate, our respiratory rate, all of these things start to match the rhythm that we're doing. If it's a song that's really upbeat and uplifting, then it's going to energize us. So hopefully you feel a little energized after that. If it's a song that's slower and relaxing, if you slow those down to little squeezes instead of taps, it can help relax your body, help you prepare for sleep. So these are great exercises that you can incorporate into your everyday life with the music that you already love. So just a little bit about my background. Again, my name is Lindsay. I'm a board certified music therapist. I also am a neurologic music therapist. So I did a little extra training past school to learn about how music interacts with your brain and exactly what hormones and what chemicals are being released when we do certain things with music. And this is such a cool thing because we, it's empowering. We are able to really change our lives and change our day-to-day -day actions by just listening to specific types of music. And I love telling people about that and empowering people to use the music, again, that you already love to do these things. I'm also a yoga teacher. I practice Reiki and healing touch and love to incorporate those things into what I do with music therapy. I have a bachelor's in music education from St. Mary of the Woods College. I'm from Indiana originally, and I received my music therapy degree from Indiana University in Indianapolis. And I am the music therapist and director of special projects at Music Works and Resounding Joy. 
A little bit about Music Works for you. Music Works was founded in 1987 by Dr. Barbara Royer. She is still our CEO and my boss. It's located in San Diego, California. And our mission is to create, cultivate, and celebrate opportunities of unlimited growth and potential. And so hopefully as you see all these different ways that you can grow and have lots of potential through music today, you'll see these things happen naturally through the music that we do. So what is music therapy? First of all, quick show of hands. How many people have heard of music therapy before? Awesome, I see some hands and I see some not raised and that's okay. So music therapy is actually a pretty, it's a relatively new field. It started in 1950 after World War II as soldiers were returning with different um, injuries but also PTSD, doctors found that if there was a volunteer musician in a patient's room, that patient needed less pain medication. So this is how music therapy came to be. They wanted to know why. So the more that they researched, and still today, the more that we research music therapy, the more we realize that our brains just love patterns. They love to organize things into patterns. So this co we see this in dance, we see this in art, we see this in music. And the more that we have our patterns, our things that we learn through music, the more beneficial it is to our brain. Therefore, the more beneficial it is to our bodies and the more beneficial it is to our emotions. So the, we're still learning lots about this as we do more, more research. But the definition of music therapy is the clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individual goals that are non-music related within a therapeutic relationship by a board certified music therapist. It is an established healthcare profession and requires a bachelor degree or an equivalency degree, a six month clinical internship and board certification exams. In this education, we learn exactly as I mentioned before, how to use music to positively affect the body, to affect the brain and to affect emotions. Music therapy actually has quite a bit of research in the Parkinson's world. And, and these are just some of the, the basic touch points that I'll get to today, but there's so much more. So music, when you are actively engaged in it, just like we just were together, even adding movement to music, or if we were making music actively together, it is what's called a dopamine flutter. So it floods your brain with dopamine. For those of you who are on medications like Carvedopa Levodopa, this is a really beneficial thing. It doesn't take the place of your medication. However, it can make your medication more effective and it can also make the effects last longer. So most of the time when we have people with Parkinson's who come to our groups, we see that the effects of less tremors, uh, better gait control, better swallowing, louder voice, those things can last hours after the group ends because of this dopamine flooding. Dopamine is also a feel-good hormone. It's a hormone that makes us feel happy. And not only does our brain flood with dopamine when we listen to music that we love, but it also floods with serotonin, another hormone and chemical that makes us feel happy, those warm, fuzzy, why we get up in the morning feelings. Singing specifically shows significant improvements in pitch duration, vocal loudness, and swallow control for people with Parkinson's. These are huge implications. Just singing every day exercises all the same muscles that you need to swallow effectively. It also helps you exercise your diaphragm, which controls your lungs and controls how much air you exhale or inhale. That control of the air helps to project your voice louder and longer. And all of that can be affected by singing. We also know that mindfulness exercises, so deep breathing, especially when they are connected with active music, those things can change the shape and the makeup of your brain. There was a study done in 2017 that showed that um, mindfulness exercises that were done consistently by people with Parkinson's, those people had a denser gray matter in their brain over time. What this means is gray, a denser gray matter helps you with memory, it helps you with um, self-worth and self-control, and just all of the ways that you identify in yourself. 
all the ways you identify yourself in your daily life. So that denser gray matter is a huge deal in quality of life and making sure that you're living your life out loud. Music is also a catalyst for neuroplasticity. This is a big fancy word that basically means that our brains are more like plastic than concrete. With concrete, we think that they're molded that way and they can't change, but our brains can change. So they're more like plastic. Over time, we can change things with them. Music actually has been shown to be a catalyst for that neuroplasticity and actually can reconnect parts of the brain around any areas that are damaged. This is again with a um, music therapist and working over time to work past that area of damage in the brain. And the last thing I have on here is active music making actually improves your immune functioning. So this is a huge deal, especially right now in the age of COVID, that active music making can indeed increase your immune functioning. This is because of the dopamine and serotonin flooding, because when that happens in the brain, it makes us feel less stressed out. When we're less stressed out, all of our internal organs are functioning at optimal levels. And when that's happening, we can better take care of ourselves. And especially our immune system is functioning at full throttle instead of partial when we're stressed out. The other thing that happens with music making that is just really fascinating is that over just a 10 minute time span of actively participating in music, so actively singing, actively dancing, actively drumming or playing an instrument, what happens in the body is an increase of T cell productions and T cells are a natural fight against cancer. So music can be a very, very beneficial way to take care of yourself. And I'm going to pause there for just a second, Shannon, and see if anyone has any questions. That was a lot of information about music. <laughs> any questions so far? Everyone. So we muted, first we unmuted everyone and then we muted everyone. So what we'll do is allow you to unmute yourself. So, yeah. So that way it's, it's not too much background noise uh, yeah. coming from everyone's home. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. So All anyone, right. feel free to unmute themselves and chime in. Oh, hi, Norma. I think you're going to say something. Yes, I was going to ask, um, what would you describe as mindfulness exercises? Norma, that's a great question. We're actually going to do one today. So mindfulness exercises can be a wide range of, of activities. The biggest thing is the intent behind it. So if your intention is to sit quietly and take a few deep breaths, that's a mindfulness exercise. If your intent is to turn on um, your favorite music that helps you feel relaxed and you sit there and you turn off your cell phone and you turn off the TV and you listen to that music and let yourself almost get completely wrapped up in the music, that's a mindfulness exercise. If you zone out in front of the TV for a half an hour, not a mindfulness exercise. Not necessarily a bad thing, <laughs> but not a mindfulness exercise. So the intent has to be there. The intent that we're we're blocking out the rest of the world for a few moments and taking just a couple minutes to breathe for ourselves. As long as that intent is there, then it is a mindfulness exercise. Great question. And we'll be able to experience one of those together today. All right. I have we'll a question. Go. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you talked about singing um, daily. And I wonder if that's a particular kind of exercise that we would need to learn. Or do you really mean just singing to the radio? Great question, Carol. So it could really honestly active engagement in music can be anything so you could be singing along with the radio um hopefully a lot of you participate in choirs like tremble clefs and um, lots of other opportunities to sing together in groups all of those things are therapeutic in and of themselves the difference between doing something like that and working with the music therapist is that a music therapist can help you pick music for specific goals 
but you're getting tons of wellness and benefit from singing with a group, whether it's at church or tremble clefts or with a music therapist. Great question. Any others? Awesome. Just we'll a see. comment. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've been singing with the tremble clefts now for several years. Not only did it, I, I used to choke. I don't have any choking. I can even sleep through the night now because I'm not choking. My voice uh, has expanded in the range and I can hit the highest G above middle C, like way up and I can go down in the tenor range. So I'm, I'm back now to my full music range of uh, tenor to high soprano. And that's because of singing with tremble clefts. Absolutely. So, Thank unbelievable you. difference. Yeah, okay. and tremble clefts is an awesome group um, to have that the social benefit of music, but also every time that you sing, you are exercising, like I said earlier, those same muscles that we use with swallowing. Um, so we have seen a lot of benefit for people with Parkinson's in that realm of swallowing, but also with the breath control that can help to um, eliminate aspiration and things like that as well. So it's, it's a really um, beneficial thing, no matter where you're singing or how you're singing, I'm always going to recommend that you're singing. <laughs> always, always. Thank you for that comment. And Lindsay, we're going to talk a little bit about tremble clefts too. Lindsay, I have a question. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. If we are listening to music with a bigger, faster beat, is that going to be better? Great question. So it depends on your on what you are aiming for. If it is late at night and you're trying to sleep, I'm going to recommend that you not listen to Katrina and the waves because what happens is that your body, it's called entrainment. Your body starts to match the tempo that you're listening to. And this happens to everyone everywhere in the world. Our heart rate, our respiratory rate, and our blood pressure start to match the music that we're listening to over time. So if I'm trying to relax and fall asleep, I don't want to be listening to something really upbeat because it's going to make my body energized to do that. But if I, um, if I want to feel energized, if it's morning time or like the beginning of this presentation, I didn't want to get you all too relaxed. <laughs> so we wanted to make sure we do something upbeat. Um, but if you're trying to relax at the end of the day, definitely something um, a little bit slower, a little bit softer, and that's going to, again, that entrainment, your body will start to match that so that you're relaxing. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great question. Is there a minimum amount of singing per day you would recommend? Oh, that's a good question. I've never gotten that one. As much as you're, you feel comfortable singing. <laughs> I, I sing all day long. Um, it's my job, so I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. But um, I encourage all the people who participate in our groups, um, we do singing and harmonica groups. Um, so I encourage them to put their harmonica out on the counter somewhere where they see it, all, where they walk by it all the time. And then I tell them every time you walk by it, pick it up and just play something on it. So it can be the same thing with music. Every time you feel like singing, please sing. Um, there's, uh, the more that you sing and the more consistently you practice, the more of these benefits you're going to see for sure. Um, so it's not necessarily hours a day, it's how many days a week you're doing it. So if you can sing one or two songs in the shower or in your living room with your spouse that, and you do it every single day, you're gonna start to see some benefit over time with that. Great question. All right. Well, Norma, this is for you. We're to our deep breath now. <laughs> I just have a quick question. Oh, yes, of course. What do you do if you used to sing badly and now every time you try to sing, all that comes out is ah! Good question, Bev. So I, I, I'm going to, um, to relate this to Linda Ronstadt. So Linda Ronstadt, a, a famous singer um, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and, and claims that she cannot sing anymore. Um, the, the research and my experience with this is that you can still sing, she can still sing, it's just different. 
And I don't want to downplay that because that has to be really difficult for her, for you, for anyone who notices that big change in their voice. That's going to be a really hard thing. And it's important to acknowledge that and be aware of that but then to try to find new ways to sing. So if you're finding that you used to sing um, up high and now it's coming out kind of squeaky, probably what needs to happen is more in your chest, use your chest voice, which are the lower notes on the piano and try singing a little bit lower than you used to um, and see if that helps. And then also working with a music therapist in your area to help you find the range that's, that's right for you now because the, the voice is still in there. It's still there, it just is different. And I am a firm believer in, in music is different for everyone every day and it's still available to you. Well, in my case, it's more a case that- A cadence? No, it's more where I start coughing or choking or just can't get anything to come out at all. I mean, I could never okay. carry a tune, but that didn't stop me. <laughs> I like that, Bev. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm more of a, a bass to tenor. Okay. I never could sing that. I mean, I can't even sing Alan Jackson. His voice, his songs are way too high for me. So. And that, that's okay. I can't sing Alan Jackson either. Only Alan <laughs> Jackson can. <laughs> So I would recommend working with um, a music therapist in your area who can help you with that. And also, um, have, I would recommend looking into working with a speech therapist too, because there might be um, some type of blocking or something in there that's causing, causing that. The other thing is that it doesn't have to be singing. Um, the other instrument that we work with a lot in our groups is harmonica. And that is an incredible instrument. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but that is one of my favorite, favorite instruments ever. And something that I really recommend um, for honestly everyone to play. But the way that a harmonica works, it's the only instrument in the world that you play by breathing through it and then breathing back in through it. So you exhale and inhale through the instrument, which basically makes it a spirometer. <laughs> Although playing a harmonica is a lot more fun than blowing into a spirometer, I promise. So that is another way that you can build up some lung capacity, some lung control, and also strengthen your lungs to maybe be able to work past that. So I would recommend looking into a harmonica and they are a very affordable, um, most of them are $10 and very fun instrument to play. All right. Thank you. We'll think about the harmonica for our mindfulness exercise. So go ahead, find both feet planted flat on the floor again. And sit up nice and tall, but allow your shoulders to melt back and down. And if you feel comfortable doing so, you can close your eyes. Or if you leave them open, focus on something that's not moving. We're going to take just a moment here together today to focus on our breath. And maybe this is the first time that you've stopped today to think about your breath. And that's okay. It's good that you're here now. On your next exhale, open your mouth and take a big audible sigh out. And through your nose, take a deep breath in. And out. Breathe in. for six, five, four, three, two, one. Inhale. Out for six. Deep 
deep breath in. Out for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Inhale. And exhale. Deep breath in. One more, inhale. Let it go. Allow your breath to flow naturally and freely. Just take a moment to notice how you feel. As you do, continue to make each breath just a little bit longer than the one before. Working towards the biggest breath you've taken yet today. On that next exhale, one more big audible sigh out. And we'll pause for just a moment to let those deep breaths sink in. To allow them to take full effect in the body. So that very brief mindfulness exercise carries with it a lot of powerful, powerful benefit. Research shows us that when we're able to exhale twice as long as our inhale, that that is when our body reaches what's called the relaxation response. The relaxation response is the natural antidote to stress and to the fight or flight reaction. And fight or flight's important. We need it to survive. We need it to pull our hand off of a hot stove if we accidentally touch it. We need it to react. We're about to run into somebody, but we don't need it 24 seven. And in our world, especially these days, it's hard to remind ourselves that we don't need to be in constant fight or flight, that it is okay for us to take a step back. And what I have always told my groups is I think about stress like a tiger. And sometimes when I'm stuck in San Diego traffic and I'm running late, it feels like there's a tiger chasing after me. It really does. And my brain doesn't know the difference between the actual tiger chasing me or San Diego traffic. So it's gonna release the exact same hormones in my body. It's gonna release cortisol and adrenaline. Cortisol and adrenaline are going to make all of the blood flow away from my internal organs into my limbs, preparing me to fight or to run. It's going to pump a lot of blood up to my eyes so that my eyes dilate. It's going to pull away a lot of energy from my immune system. And in that exact second, if I'm actually being chased by a tiger, these are good things. I can react to the tiger. But if it's just San Diego traffic, not a tiger, I don't need those hormones coursing through my body. And if every single day I have that exact same experience, those hormones build up over time. And then if I have too much cortisol in my body, too much adrenaline in my body, then what happens is my body is in constant fight or flight, which is a really dangerous place to be. And we talked a little bit earlier about how music can help to combat that so that we have our immune system healthy, so that our internal organs, our digestive system, our heart, our lungs are getting the blood that they need, the oxygen that they need. 
So over time, it's really important to address stress. And again, in our very hectic world right now, even more important maybe than normal for us to take a step back and take those breaths. And research shows that just five, five breaths like we just did is enough to reset the relaxation response in your body. And so if you can commit to five deep breaths a day, you will notice a difference. And just like that research study I mentioned from 2017, over time, if you practice that every day over time, then what happens is your gray matter in your brain starts to become more dense, which also helps with memory. So it's a very, very important thing for us as an entire human race to just take a step back and take those deep breaths because it's not a tiger. And then if it is a tiger, get that fight or flight going and we can address it. But traffic isn't a tiger. <laughs> Any questions about our mindfulness exercise before we move on? Awesome, hopefully we're all nice and relaxed but not too relaxed. We still have some music to make. <laughs> All right, we'll keep going. So um, I mentioned earlier that I am, I am a music therapist. I work for a company called Music Works. And five years ago, we were called by the San Diego Parkinson's Association. And they said, we want a curriculum for people with Parkinson's to address their voice. So they hired us to write this curriculum and to begin to test it with different groups. Our first group met in March of 2016, and that's when we came up with the name Audibility. So odd coming from sound, and then we wanted to focus on the ability of people. So when we were, um, Bev, when we were talking earlier about your voice, we wanted to find everyone's voice, whatever that ability was, and not focus on the things that they're unable to do, but focus on the things they are able to do. So we began in 2016 with that first group, and since um, that first program, which focused solely on singing in the voice, we've expanded to include that voice class, two different harmonica classes, piano, ukulele, chair yoga, and mindfulness and drumming classes, all with different um, things that we're looking at for people with Parkinson's, and now they're all available virtually. Um, we had not thought about trying these virtually, but um, thanks to the current pandemic, we, we knew that something was better than nothing. So we moved our groups online and what we found was that virtual is actually better in several, um, several cases than um, in person was. So we're, we're learning every day and that's thanks to the awesome people in our audibility groups that we're learning those things. So our goals for these classes, our number one goal for each of our audibility classes is first and foremost that we improve or maintain volume and clarity of the voice. And we know that by improving or maintaining your voice, it directly affects your quality of life because everyone has something to say and what you have to say is important and we want to be able to hear it. So that's what we focus on in the classes. Um, we turn things that you say in your everyday life into music. And we'll talk about how one of those exercises work in just a moment. We also are looking at improving or maintaining breath support and lung capacity. So also very important, not just for projecting your voice, but also for your mental health and emotional health. And bringing in those deep breathing exercises is a great way to address that. Also, supporting um, breath control and lung capacity um, is, is a way to um, mitigate aspiration and pneumonia. Um, it's not the only way, and of course, you have to work with a doctor for that, and medication for that is really important. However, music can benefit things that you're already doing um, to, to work against that pneumonia. We also work to improve or maintain swallow functioning. So again, all of the muscles that we use to swallow are muscles that we're going to use when we speak and muscles that we use when we sing. If you take your fingers and put them right at the base of your throat, you can feel your, and talk or sing, you can feel those muscles working. You can feel that, that 
vibration right there. So singing is a great way to address those muscles and to address that swallow functioning as well. And I'm a little bit biased, but I think it's more fun than a spirometer. <laughs> um, same with harmonica. <laughs> um, also, we're looking at increasing quality of life. And we do that through decreasing stress and anxiety, increasing the opportunity for socialization, and learning to play a musical instrument. We have a lot of people who come to us who have never played an instrument. Um, they might come in and say, I'm 75. I've always wanted to learn how to play piano. I've never tried. What can you do for me? We're going to get you playing piano. And we have ways to do that. And that's the music therapist's job to figure out how to make that possible for that person. And we are very fortunate to work with a lot of very creative um, instrument companies and other therapists throughout the world who can help us make those things possible for people. And then we also provide music-based tools to address challenges in everyday life. We think it's very, very important for you to do classes like this, to do classes like Rocksteady Boxing and, um, and Trimble Clefts to get involved with these things. However, we want to make sure that you're taking all of the awesome things you're learning in these classes and implementing, implementing them in everyday life. That's what it's all about, right? What can you take home and use every single day? So we make sure that we give people different assignments and things to work on at home. And because of this, we also encourage care partners to take the classes with their loved one with Parkinson's so that they know what we're working on and they can help facilitate that practice at home. Just like I mentioned earlier, I think it was Lynn who asked how many times you should sing a day. Um, that the same, the same thing goes for this. The more you do it, the more benefit you're gonna see from it. So that consistent practice is important. So how do we address these goals? How do we make these things um, possible? A lot of different fun interventions in our groups. Singing is a big one. Even in our harmonica groups and our piano groups and our drumming groups, we're singing. We're singing on top of everything else because it is so good. It's like a cognitive workout for you to sing while you're drumming. And in fact, music is the only thing that we do as humans that involves the entire brain all at once. And that's because there are so many things happening all at once. It's not just vocalizing, it's vocalizing and reading music and thinking about volume control, all these different things happening at once. And because of that, it lights up the whole brain all at once. And that goes back to why it's such a good catalyst for neuroplasticity, because it exercises everything in the brain at the same time. Um, it's exhausting to think about if you break it down, <laughs> but when you're playing music and actively engaged in music, it's one of those things that um, you see the benefit of, whether or not you're thinking about it. We also do a lot of music instrument play. So I mentioned the harmonica, we do piano. Um, piano, we're specifically also looking at finger dexterity. And again, that cognitive exercise, it's a huge cognitive exercise to play piano. And then lots of little things too. Drumming, um, drumming helps with gait. So it helps with your walking. It helps with um, exercising to be able to do different movements that are a pattern. So if we're talking about maybe putting on a seatbelt in our drumming class, we may have a tambourine behind you right here and then a big drum down here at the bottom so that you have to hit the tambourine go across your body and hit that big drum at the bottom. And what that does is it helps your brain to organize that pattern of movement so that when you leave, even if you don't have a tambourine and a drum in your car, you still remember that movement because it's connected by the music. And when it's connected by the music, it stays in your brain longer. It helps to prime that memory. That's why the ABCs are in our head all the time. And also why, um, Pro, you know, several of you might be able to remember every lyric to a song from your prom or from your wedding, um, where it might be hard to remember a phone number. It's easier to remember things when they're put to music. And that's how music affects the brain and works in the brain. We also do a lot of music and movement. Same thing I was talking about with the seatbelt. Pattern, making movement into pattern so that it's easier to remember. And this goes along with dance too. 
um, so that you can put it to the dance or put it to music and it's primed the brain for remembering that movement and being able to recall that movement later. We also work on songwriting. We're going to be doing a little teeny bit of that as a group here in just a minute. Um, and that helps with expression. Um, during COVID, we have had um, our blues harmonica group has released two different um, COVID blues songs. Um, just a great way to kind of process how we're feeling about all of this craziness. And then also a great way to just a fun way to work it through it in a group. We also do verbal processing. So again, everything that we do that we sing, we eventually take all the music out of it and what's left is just the voice because as much as we would like it to be, life is not a musical <laughs> and we have to talk sometimes. So um, we wanna be able to help you get back to that speaking voice um, from the singing voice. And that's exactly what I'm gonna demonstrate here in just a minute with everybody. And then we also do music and creative arts. So just another way to express. And um, especially with Parkinson's disease and emotions and different things um, that come up, depression is something that is a concern. And so we like to address those things in our therapy sessions in different ways, give you different tools so that you can um, address these things in your everyday life outside of our groups. Um, one of my favorite things that we do as a group are our man mandalas. A mandala is a circle that you color and we do it as a group. And there was a really great study done in 2016 about coloring. And what they found, they did a um, ma magnetic imaging on people's brains while they were coloring, praying and meditating. And afterwards they saw that they were all three exactly the same. And that's because when you're coloring, you're only focused on one little piece of that at a time. And so it helps you to block out all those other stressors and things that are going on, helps you just to focus on the here and now. And that's exactly what meditation and prayer does as well. So coloring can be a really beneficial thing. After that study was released, that's when we saw the big outpouring of adult coloring books. So that's why those are out there. If you see one, I recommend grabbing it and maybe coloring to some music. It's a great, great way to um, add mindfulness to your day. All right, before we sing, do we have any questions? There was one question in the chat, Lindsay. Yes, thank you, Andrea. Um, okay, can you tell us about uh, so a metronome pace is good for walking and balance. Can you talk about that a little bit, how maybe a drum beat can help? Yes, yes, thank you. So um, a metronome or something that's keeping a steady beat, so really any song that you're listening to, ties back into the entrainment that I mentioned earlier where your blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rate start to match that rhythm. The same thing will happen with your feet in your body. And you can see this um, the next time we're able to go back to a sports stadium. <laughs> um, if you look down at the ground, everyone is walking to the beat of the music that's playing. They don't even know they're doing it. It's just happening. And that is entrainment. That's your body wants to move to that beat because our brains love patterns and it makes sense to our brains. That's why we match that beat when we're walking. So if we wanted to work on gait um, specifically, then what we could do if your gait is really fast, let's say you shuffle and it's a really quick paced gait, that's, that's a recipe for falling, right? It's an important thing to address. So what I would do is find music that matches your current gait pattern right now because the other thing about music therapy is we always want to meet people where they are now um if i walked into the room and you were having a bad day and i said we're gonna blare the happiest music in the world just be happy you'd be like please leave <laughs> so first we have to acknowledge that you're having a bad day let's talk about that first and then let's work up towards making you feel better same thing with walking i wouldn't slow down that that pace right away okay? I would match the, the beat of your current gait. And then from there, we would talk about specific things. So I, maybe I would add two different sounds because when we walk, we don't want the feet to shuffle forward. Um, and just having one sound might make you think, oh, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. But if I had boom, boom, or here, let me turn on my keyboard. 
it's right here. So if I wanted to, to do something different, if I had two sounds like this going, then what I could do is say the low sound is your heel. I want your heel to strike right there. The higher sound, I want your toes to come down. So we would just work on that. So this would just be you lifting up your foot, heel strike, toe strike, heel strike, toe strike, and working from there. Then there would be, there's a lot more, right? Than just the, the heel strike and the toe strike. There's a whole knee bend. There's the placing the foot forward. So we would add a sound for each of those things. And adding in that singing part, heel strike, toe strike, heel, toe, heel, toe. What that does in my brain, because I'm putting it to a melody, my memory is going to remember that better. So we could have a whole song just based on how you're walking and how you should think about how you're walking. <laughs> and then in everyday life, the thing that you could incorporate that is, I'm not expecting you to go around and sing that every day, but maybe if there's a moment where you freeze, helping you to take a deep breath so that we let go of some of that stress because freezing is a scary, stressful thing. Take a deep breath first and then think that song. Heel strike, toe strike, heel, toe, heel, toe. And for you, it might sound a little bit different. This is why working with the music therapist is beneficial because we're gonna take the music that you like and we're gonna use it to address things like this. Um, a specific example of that, one person that I worked with um, with Parkinson's was having trouble um, falling out of bed in the morning because he would get up really fast. Um, so he was he's a big fan of the Beatles. So we use the song, Let It Be, and each time we, he sang Let It Be, something different was happening. So that when he sat up, it was, let it be, was him sitting up. And then let it be was him turning towards the side. Let it be, plant your left foot. Let it be, plant your right foot. And then you have speaking words of wisdom. Let it be, you have that whole time to stand up from there. So that's one of the things that we might be able to do um, is work with you specifically on that music that you love and that you're already singing in your head and that you're already listening to. How can we make that really beneficial for you in everyday life? Did that answer that question? I think probably, it <laughs> probably more than you asked for. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's sing together a little bit. So we are going to, this is, oops. This is a specific exercise that we do called found phrases. And these are common phrases that you might use on a daily basis. And what I want you to think about is a phrase that you use on a daily basis where the reaction from the person you're talking to is, huh, or what, or hopefully more polite, like pardon me, or can you please repeat that? What's something that you say often that you get that response? Anybody? I feel fatutzed. I feel fatutzed? Yes. That's an awesome word. Is that the first time anyone else is hearing that word, fatutzed? <laughs> Norma, what, what does it mean to feel fatutzed? I, I think it's Yiddish. Um, it, it, my grandfather um, lived in Manhattan Island and did a lot of business with Jews and, and picked up a lot of Yiddish. And it's, it's just being, um, upset and frustrated. Ugh, I feel fatutzed. I love it. It's going to become part of my everyday vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So hey, honey, can you help me with? Hey, honey, can you help me with? Insert anything. <laughs> Frank, did you have one too? Oh, can Shannon, would you be able to unmute Frank? I see you talking, Frank. We're going to get you unmuted. I think he needs to unmute himself. I'm trying to unmute from my end, but it's not working. Um, so, Frank, are you on a computer? You'll have to hit the unmute button, the, the red line microphone. Do you see that on your screen? 
We can't hear you. Unless anyone is good at ri uh, lip reading. <laughs> we want to hear what you have to say, Frank. Darn. Tell him to wiggle the cursor and then the thing will show up. So if you're on a computer, if you hover your mouse over the Zoom window in front of you, a toolbar appears at the bottom of your screen. And then on the left-hand side, there's a microphone that you'll need to hit. And unmute everybody. <laughs> mute again. You could try. Let's see. The upgrade to five took away your ability to unmute us. You can mute us, but we have to unmute ourselves. Correct. That was that new improvement. <laughs> new safety feature. All right. Well, Sorry, Frank. Hold, hold their space bar down and talk. If he's on a computer, that can work. If you're on a computer, Frank, you can hold this the space bar, like like a walkie-talkie. That or works. That. <laughs> oh, Frank, I'm sorry. So sorry. We can. You can always email me these two. I'm happy to to write one for you. Um. So we have. I feel fatigued which I just like to say. And then also, hey, honey, can you help me with insert word here? Um, so let's, let's try the, hey, honey, can you help me? I'm going to listen to the normal way that I say that phrase and think about the contour or the shape that I'm making when I say that phrase. Hey, honey, can you help me? So that is starts out higher. Hey, honey, can you help me? So there's actually a melody that happens within that phrase. And I'm gonna put it on the piano. We'll do that. So it's gonna sound like this. Hey honey, can you help me? And I would like for you all to sing it with me. Before you do, plant both feet on the floor, sit up nice and tall, roll your shoulders up by your ears, and then take them back and down. And we're going to take a deep, deep breath in. Here we go. Hey, honey, can you help me? Again. Hey, honey, can you help me? One more time. Hey, honey, can you help me? Perfect. Now this time, speak it, but in that rhythm. Ready? Hey, honey, can you help me? Again. Hey, honey, can you help me? One more time. Hey, honey, can you help me? Exactly. So what we did, that's called scaffolding. So we start out full music. And like I said earlier, unfortunately, we don't live in a musical, no matter how much I try to make that real. So I have to take away the music eventually. But some cool things happen. When we start out singing something, our brain thinks, ooh, we're singing. When my brain thinks, ooh, I'm singing, what it does is takes in extra oxygen than if I'm just speaking. So we just tricked our body into taking in more oxygen when we speak, just like when we sing. So we do that. The other thing that happens is that we create this cadence, this rhythm. Hey, honey, can you help me? And when I do that, when I speak in that rhythm, it's a lot more articulate. The tempo is good. And also we work on all those different, excuse me, those different pitch ranges. Hey, honey, can you help me? And when I add in those different pitch ranges, it's a lot easier to understand the phrase. Hey, honey, can you help me? Then if it was just, hey, honey, can you help me? It makes it a lot easier to understand. So it just helps with articulation, helps with bringing in that breath, and helps us be able to, um, to match the pitches so that someone can hear us and understand us completely. So that's an example of something that we might do with music. And I can't believe that it's 529. <laughs> I'm just having too much fun with everybody tonight.
Um, so real quickly, how can you get involved with music therapy or similar programs? Find a board certified music therapist in your area and take private instrument lessons. P pull out that piano that you haven't played in 30 years or pick an instrument that you're like, oh, I've always wanted to learn the flute. Let's play. <laughs> Let's figure it out together. Contact your local Parkinson's associations to find out what groups and classes are offered in your area. Join a choir like Tremble Clefs or a church choir. Check out programs like LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. They incorporate a lot of rhythm into what they do. Get moving through dance or rock steady boxing. Um, boxing is very rhythmic. In fact, we've worked with rock steady boxing to do live drumming during their classes because it's super rhythmic. They're doing the exact same thing we are, just through a different medium. Join a virtual audibility group. Come sing with me. I would love to see you in one of our groups. And then also sing along with the radio, sing in your shower, sing in the car, sing anywhere, sing a lot. <laughs> And this is an example of our current audibility schedule. Um, our voice class is on Mondays at 11 a.m. Um, Pacific time. Audibility harmonica is Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And then we offer a chair yoga class on Fridays at 2 p.m. Pacific time. And my email's there. And I think Rebecca has the link, um, or Shannon has the link. Um, to share with you if you're interested in joining our mailing list. All of our classes right now are um, donation based. We just want people to know we're here to support you and that we'd love to make music with you. And hopefully I've answered most of your questions. Um, ladies, do we have a moment for people to ask more? If they have Ooh, more. Or... Uh, Frank, can we've been waiting on Frank and I think that he figured out the unmute. Oh. Yay! oh, there you go, Frank. Hi, Frank. Hi, guys. I'm so glad to be with you guys. Um, I kind of forgot the question I wanted to ask. <laughs> I'm just happy to hear your voice, Frank. That's fine. <laughs> well, I do have a voice. Um, my most used expression orally during the day is, pardon me, couldn't you repeat that, please? <laughs> I use that often. I did have my ears checked. My hearing is okay for some reason or other. I, I hope it's uh, an abundance of the people that I'm surrounded with. But uh, even so, my wife at times teases me and says, something's wrong with your ears. They're not. They have good ears, but I use that expression often. Pardon me. Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, and that's one that we could put with music, too. Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> with some of the people I hang with, I don't think I would get too far. <laughs> well, see, you just do that with me, Frank. And then we take the music away so that when you go back, you have a very powerful, pardon me, can you repeat that, please? <laughs> I think I can do that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Any other well, questions or, or comments? Lindsay, I got to say, this is one of the most informative, pleasant bit of oral uh, association I've had since I've been involved with this Parkinson business. Oh, it's thank a you, happy time. It's a happy time for me. I got to say one thing socially as a side note. I've met a lot of Parkinson people where I'm located and it seems like Parkinson and being nice go together. I have never met, thank God, up to this point in my life, somebody who has Parkinson that's mean or evil or disrespectful. It seems like if you get Parkinson, it makes you a nice person. It might be a little fabricated, but it's not. I mean that sincerely. I, I, would, I would agree with that. I, I, everyone that I've ever met who's a person with Parkinson's has been nothing but wonderful and inspiring and yeah. makes me love what I do on a daily basis. Yeah. I'm so glad you figured out your audio because that is just a beautiful way to, uh, to wrap this session, Frank. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful comment. I have a confession to make. I was alone up to that point, but my wife walked in the door and she knew that I was trying to unmute and she just <laughs> sat down and hit the button just before. And it's good, now, to have, good to have a support system. <laughs> I've had one for That's like 50, I've had my support system for about 57 years. 
That's no exaggeration. When did I get married? 60, you got it. <laughs> 60, 1962, I think I got I think I got married. It's been so long I forgot. And what's your wife's name? Beautiful. What's your wife's name, Frank? Her my wife's name is Phyllis. So Let's she all say thank you, Phyllis. And thank, thank you, you so Phyllis. Much. Good job, Phyllis. <laughs> thank you. She is a, really a very expensive caregiver. <laughs> <laughs> Good, you deserve the best. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I think we all agree. If you see all the smiles here, I think everyone would agree with Frank that this was a delightful hour. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for joining us and teaching us. We did mindfulness, we sang, we danced. And if that's any, you know, sneak preview into the kind of uh, um, work that you do with audibility and music works and I think yeah I think you might have some uh, some new members in the crowd so we'll, we would love it. yeah so we'll um, uh, post this recording and then be sure to include um, that link it is in the chat um, and if you're in Zoom on a computer, there's three dots um, on the side of the chat and you can save all of the chat or you could just highlight. Shannon pasted it in there at 531. It will take us until tomorrow to get that recording and everything posted. So if people can't wait, I wanna make sure you knew how to do it right away. But um, thank you again. Any closing words, Lindsay? If not, we always like to um, turn on our video cameras and have some virtual eye contact and wave goodbye. Maybe you could add some music to our, our wave goodbye somehow and tell us how to uh, take it up a notch. Absolutely. Everything's better with music. <laughs> All right. Turn on those cameras. And we'll go. Bye bye, so long. Goodbye, so long. See you later. See you later. But for now, goodbye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye. Prosper. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Have a great evening. It was great, Lindsay. Oh, thank you all. It was so much fun to be with you this evening. Made my day. <laughs> Us too. Us too. Bye. Hope to see Bye. you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.